Uh, we're a business that's been in Madison since 1980. Um, the, uh, I started collecting this information when we, uh, Isthmus Engineering, uh, started looking into installing some charging stations for plug-in electric vehicles. And uh, we actually partnered with MG&E, our utility here, uh, and they helped us through the process. Uh, but as part of that decision-making process, uh, I put together some information on the history of electric vehicles, which um, I was astounded when I learned a lot of it. Um, and it turns out that a lot of other people are too. So uh, I provided this information to our board of directors as we were making decisions and deciding to move forward with that project. So. Since that time, this information has kind of taken on a life of its own. It uh, covers a lot of different things. I hope you're ready for it all. Um, it covers a lot of ground. I'm going to cover uh, more than 200 years of history. Um, it, uh, I could rename this thing. I, we call it the history or the forgotten history of electric vehicles. Uh, we could call it completely useless trivia. We could call it early, early automotive history. Um, the start of the Industrial Revolution, um, the history of electricity. I'll even cover parts of women's suffrage before I'm done here today. So um, I'm going to cover a lot in a short amount of time. So I uh, apologize for my boring background. I'm actually going to use the marker board behind me, so I am going to use it. But I, I love the uh, more exciting backgrounds that I see here today. So without further ado, uh, let's move forward. So our knowledge or perceptions of a subject may not be correct. Our opinions may be based on outdated information or circumstances. Information that we have may be purposely hidden from us and we may have been outright lied to. As an example, Elon Musk would have us believe that the Tesla Model S in the ludicrous mode is the quickest production car in the world and it would be the first time an electric car has ever done that. So it's 2020 now, um, interestingly enough, the T for the Tesla emblem isn't really a T. It's actually a cross-section of the motor that was designed by Nikola Tesla. That's the image in the lower left-hand corner is actually a cross-section of that motor. So that's where the emblem actually came from. It just conveniently also looks like a T. I'm going to flip back to 1750 and the other end of my presentation. It was about this time that Benjamin Franklin hypothesized that if you flew a kite into a thunderstorm, that the static electricity would charge a key, would spark a key. He never actually did this experiment. He was smart enough to not do it. Uh, funny thing is, after he published a paper on it, a Frenchman did a something of a, an experiment proving it, but they didn't actually use a kite and a key. Uh, Franklin went on to uh, uh, patent the uh, lightning rod, and he started the first insurance company to guard against fires by lightning. Um, he did not design an electric vehicle, but he was really part, it was about this time frame that people started to understand what electricity was, uh, Nobody takes credit for discovering it. Uh, ben Franklin actually used static electricity as a bunch of parlor tricks. Um, so, if I asked you who invented the automobile, what would be the first thing that would pop into your head? Ford. Most Americans would jump at Henry Ford. That's right. Yep, yeah. the 1908 Model T. Well, if I go to the middle here, and I say that's about the middle. It's not really. It's actually a little bit on the other side. And I'll put up 1908 for Model T. Um, this actually isn't where I'm starting my presentation. This is where I'm ending my presentation. This is kind of the end of innovation, 1908. Um, so all of my time is going to be spent on the other side of that, that timeline. Um, is the, the Model T was an innovative uh, automobile, um, but there was a lot that came before it. Um, and uh, we'll talk about that a little more here in the upcoming. You probably know that the Model T wasn't the first car. Um, 
what made the Model T famous is Ford developed an assembly line, uh, which by 1913 he was mass producing cars at an affordable rate. So his, his workers could afford his cars. Most Germans would answer that same question, who invented the automobile with Carl Benz in 1885. Carl Benz patented the motor carriage. Um, arguably, arguably, it's partially true, he did patent uh, an internal combustion engine driven, uh, I have a hard time calling it a car, it's more of a tricycle. Carl Benz owned a construction company and a bicycle shop and he converted basically a bicycle, a tricycle, uh, with a one-cylinder internal combustion four-stroke engine, um, had no suspension, it had a lever for a steering wheel, um, hard rubber tires, and if you were lucky it could haul one person. You had to push it to get it to start moving. So, But he did patent it, and he, he, Carl Benz was a very brilliant engineer. He uh, came a long way after this, and we'll talk about him upcoming here also. In actuality, a Vermont blacksmith in 1834 made an electric motor move a small horseless carriage. He actually started with a toy. So we're talking 1834. We're actually closer to Ben Franklin than the Model T. Um, this really took place in the dawn of electricity. Ohm's Law wasn't published until 1827. Faraday's Law of Induction wasn't published until 1831. Davenport patented what was called an electric machine, which was an electric motor in 1837. And he actually made it do something. He, he gave it motion. Um, his first carriages were on tracks, uh, battery powered, but you had to go where the tracks went. Um, and his work laid the groundwork for a lot of other inventors in the future. By the 1850s, there was electric streetcars that were being experimented with. They were commercially used by the 1880s. And the term car actually comes from the term carriage, or out of horseless carriage, if you were curious. But um, So when we looked at Carl Benz in 1885 patenting, patented a motor car that could barely haul one person, before that, we were actually using streetcars, electric streetcars, to move dozens of people at a time, and they were commonplace in bigger cities. It's easy to argue that Davenport's experimentation with electromagnets had a huge effect on the world. Electromagnets are used everywhere, not only in automotive, but every motor, robot, the memory in your computer. And I could easily argue that Thomas Davenport had as big of an effect on society as Ford or Benz did. Given the fact that we were hauling people with street electric streetcars in the 1850s, uh, 1880, it's kind of amazing that oil wasn't even discovered until 1859 in Titusville, Pennsylvania. You can see that oil fields in 1850 were just as beautiful then as they are today. By the 1890s, London had a fleet of 77 electric taxi cabs. It's called the Bursey Electric Cab Company. Um, I showed this to a couple people from Union Cab, and they were floored with the, the story. But So the, the cab it looked more like a carriage, four wheels, um, had a motor that drove the two rear wheels. Um, the picture on the left is uh, the, the Scotland Yard first license plate for an, uh, an electric cab. Um, some of these still exist. They're in museums in London, believe it or not. There was a lot of innovation going on at the time. Um, there's some argument about these uh, gasoline electric hybrids. This is the first one that I found information on. It's kind of an amazing vehicle, actually. It's the first gas electric hybrid. It had an electric starter. It had regenerative braking. Um, the gas motor uh, supplied the generator or the electricity for the, um, well, well, this one could torque share. Um, so the, between the gas motor and the electric motor. So this car, is still in existence, believe it or not, and in 2016 it sold for almost half a million dollars. Now we're coming up to Ferdinand Porsche. How many people here would like to uh, drive a Porsche? Raise your hand. How many people have a Porsche? 
You can put your hand back down, nobody can see you anyway. Um, his first car, not only his first car, his first half a dozen cars were all electric. He was, he was a very innovative in what he did. The P1 debuted in 1898, and that's an actual photograph of it. Um, it had two electric motors mounted in the wheels. Uh, he entered it in a competition at the end of the century against 120 other car makers. And the competition included both performance and efficiency. His car won both categories. The same car won both categories. Um, this eventually led, his next design was actually a four-wheel drive design that had a motor integrated into each wheel. Um, Porsche, if you read any of the history of Porsche, he claims to have the first gas electric hybrid, but there's video of that other vehicle uh, running, which is two years before uh, this Porsche vehicle came out. So. This original car, the one in the upper left-hand corner, was rediscovered in a barn in 2014. Nobody knew what it was. And it's now sitting in a Porsche museum. Um, and they've, uh, the picture on the right-hand side is they kind of uh, mocked up what the seats used to look like. Those seats had rotted away over the years. So when did this phenomenon hit the US? It actually had been here the whole time all the way back to the streetcars and Thomas Davenport. By the turn of the century, there were 15,000 electric cars running around the streets of New York. Not 150, not 1,500, 15,000 electric cars. They even had public charging stations. I've been around cars my whole life. I grew up working at my dad's gas station. Um, I couldn't believe that I had never seen one of these before, so I started searching, and sure enough, there's video, there's all kinds of things you can see. I've uh, captured a video here, hopefully it comes through, you guys can actually see this. Um, but this is uh, on YouTube, uh, I thank them for the use of this, um, and it's an episode of Jay Leno's Garage. If you search for Jay Leno and Baker Electric on YouTube, you'll come up with this video. And I'm gonna play part of it here, just so you can see one running around. And I'm gonna just get we're way up here. So this is what the car looks like. You won't hear, you'll hear me talking and not the audio of the video. But So this is uh, a 1906 Baker Electric. Uh, it was based on a six volt uh, lead acid battery. Um, this has the original motor in it and the motor has never been rebuilt. Um, difference between an electric vehicle and a, you know, a, an internal combustion engine and an electric motor, there's basically one moving part. In an internal combustion engine today, there are hundreds and hundreds of moving parts. So these things can last forever. That's why they're so low uh, maintenance cost. Um, this is kind of an interesting vehicle. If I, I want to go back just a little bit and show you how they, it doesn't have a steering wheel. It has what they call a tiller. Um, so if your belly was too big, you couldn't turn to the right. You had to keep turning left. If you have time at some point, I, I do uh, uh, recommend that you go on to uh, uh, YouTube and, and look for that video. Uh, this is an ad for that car. Uh, Daddy, get me a bit, uh, baker. It's a beauty and runs as still as a mouse. Um, they nicknamed these cars hummingbirds. And there was actually a, a marketing push by the oil companies to, to market these cars only to women because you weren't manly if you couldn't start an internal combustion engine with a crank. Um, so that, that ended up being one of the things that sank electric vehicles back in the day. It was, uh, it, they were, you know, it was considered like a handbag, a ladies accessory. How is it possible that a company was able to manufacture 15,000 cars before Henry Ford uh, did the assembly line, mass produced on an assembly line. Turns out that one company didn't do it. I found a catalog. This is a 1907 catalog with various manufacturers. Uh, you can see the title along the top, Electric Pre Pleasure Cars Costing Less Than $1,600. Um, and you'll see at the bottom, it's page 114. I'm just going to fly through the pages here. I didn't copy all the pages, but it went up to page 131. That's 17 pages of different car companies making electric cars in 1907. 
If I go back to page 122, that video that we just watched with the Baker, the Baker Model L, you can see the price was $2,000, the body was made of wood, it could haul, this says two people, but the car that we saw actually could haul four, so it must have been a slightly different model. Um, this one weighs 1,600 pounds, it had a range of 80 miles, six speed forwards and three reverse. I was astounded when I saw that there were this many cars and so few exist today. I call the, the Model T the end of innovation. Um, if we look at today's uh, best-selling sedans, the, the Ford Fusion, the, the Toyota Camry, Honda Accord, Chevy Malibu, I happen to pick all the same color cars from each one and you can see how totally different they all are. Um, but you know, what we expect in a car today, we don't want a three-wheel tricycle. You know, we want the balance of four wheels. We want a steering wheel, pneumatic tires, soft ride suspension, able to seat at least four people, uh, two-door, four-door models, coupe, convertible maybe, bumpers, at least 28 miles to the gallon, leather or cloth interior, and we want, you know, good safety four-wheel braking. Um, you know, we, we expect this in any vehicle that we buy today. Well, if I, if I add in the Model T, the Model T covers all of that. We haven't changed hardly anything other than the body size and shape, some of the, the comfort and safety uh, things that we expect in a car. And actually, if you take a step further back, Model T came in a truck version, a tractor version, and if you knew the dealer really well, you could have them do both, a truck and a tractor on the same Model T, have a convertible rolled into it. So in a lot of ways, you can see why the Model T was so innovative. So we're going to stop here for a minute, and I'm going to ask, uh, a few of these questions. Did you learn anything new? Uh, when we go to all video, we'll see if anybody give us a thumbs up if you did. Was there anything that surprised you? You can use the chat box or maybe your voice to chime in. Why do you think this isn't common knowledge and have we been lied to? Yes, we've been lied to. My name is Shar Braxton. A lot of history is distorted and basically it really fits the either organization or the individual who it's going to benefit. So, yeah, the thing with Mr. Ford did not surprise me at all. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm glad, um, Mr. Olson, that you're doing this workshop. And when I seen it, I was just so excited. So thank you. You're very welcome. You're going to be excited to see some of the things coming up yet, too. So, Thank you. Anything that surprised anyone? Feel free to hop off mute. You might be muted if you're talking. <laughs> I guess I would just chime in and I'm just really surprised at the uh, the early development. I kind of understood there was early development, but the amount of makes and models and the variety, and the, the number of manufacturers uh, worldwide, it's it's pretty amazing. Um, and I guess my my question, unless I missed it, but you know, what was what was the big driver that you know? Besides for it being, uh, you know, the, the advertising for that one vehicle being for, you know, for women drivers versus men. But, I mean, what, what's some of the big significant things that took this industry down and moved us to the gas? Uh, it's an excellent question. Um, the, uh, so the electric car, at the time, the electric motors were about 30% efficient. Um, the internal combustion engine was also uh, around 30% efficient also. Uh, the thing about uh, petroleum gas is it's a very dense way to hold energy. Um, you know, one gallon of compressed gas is equivalent to 17 sticks of dynamite. So it's very easy and very portable to make it. Um, so the urban areas 
the you know bigger cities, big populations had electricity at the turn of the century, the turn of that century. Um, unfortunately, uh, rural America did not have uh, much electricity. Even uh, in 1937, uh, FDR put through the bill the the rural uh, electrical rural electrical rural electric rural electrification act that's hard to say um, at that time only 10 percent of rural america had electricity in 1937. Um, once fdr did that over a 15-year span um, by 1951 90 percent of rural america had electricity so you know the electric grid didn't get out until rural areas uh, until you know the rural electric co-ops picked it up and, and ran with it. Um, so th that's what really held back, I think, the electric vehicle. I mean, I think there was a big push by the oil companies to hold it back too. Uh, they were part of the marketing strategy to to list electric cars as women's vehicles, um, and the uh, utilities were heavily regulated. You know, every city wanted one electric company. They didn't want a bunch of different power lines and different grids. And um, I don't know if you remember the movie that came out a year or two ago called Current Wars, and it was the fight between Edison and, and Tesla about AC or DC electricity. Well, uh, cities wanted to standardize on that, so they regulated uh, the electric grid. And it wasn't the, the Wild West like the oil industry was, where companies could just come in and and you know, dig it out of the ground for free and, and sell it wherever they could. You know, the, so the, the oil industry was really the Wild West. There was a lot of profit to be made. Um, and there, weren't, you know, there were no thoughts about sustainability at that time. So that's really, I think, uh, the, why there was such a downfall. Interestingly enough, you know, we've marched along with the internal combustion engine for over 110 years now, since then, since the Model T. And the internal combustion engine is only about 40% efficient now. It's hardly gained anything. Um, most of the energy when we burn fuel is dissipated as heat or sound. We only capture, we only turn 40% of it into motion. Um, electrically speaking, our electric motors are now 80, 90% efficient. So there's a, a good reason why the, why the Tesla Model S can be much quicker than a, an internal combustion engine. So. Um, that's, I think, part of the reason it, it turned, it, you know, it changed, um, there, but there are many reasons. So th those are the big ones probably now. Um, there's, a, you know, there was always, uh, I do want to throw in, there was always conspiracy theories. I heard them the whole time growing up about, um, carburetors that could get 100 miles to the gallon, but the oil companies squished it. And, and uh, you know, a lot of that was just that, a conspiracy theory. Uh, there was a lot of countries that are very innovative, I'll use Japan as the one, that has no natural resources. They didn't have fuel. If they could have come up with a 100 mile per gallon carburetor, they would have done it a long time ago. So the, the uh, chances that we're gonna jump, you know, leapfrog from 40% for an internal combustion engine and catch back up to an electric motor are pretty dim. That's not going to happen. Um, I think electrical, you know, uh, there, there's a big future for um, the uh, electric version of in the automobile uh, industry. So. There's some great uh, chat and comments going on in the chat box. Um, and a question just came in from Dave Ben Ferrado. Um, I think I'll save that question to uh, for the Q and A at the end, and we'll move on with the next part of the presentation. Um, so we have time at the end for questions. Okay. That like Holly? Okay. Yep. Good right. with me. All right. I'm going to share my screen again. All right, so here we are. I'm gonna go back to the last question. Have we been lied to? Was the information being hidden from us? Whoops. To the best of my knowledge, everything that I presented is true, but I am changing history because I left out some of the best parts. 
my heroes, it turns out in this story, are three women. Emily Davenport, Bertha Benz, Bertha Benz as the Germans pronounce it, and Claire Ford. Emily Davenport took meticulous notes of all the experiments her husband did. Um, she is the reason there's no any history of it at all. Thomas was a brilliant, and you'd call him an engineer, there wasn't that title at the time, he was a blacksmith, but he didn't take notes, he didn't write anything down. So if it wouldn't be for Emily, nobody could have based anything they did beyond that without her taking the notes. She was heavily involved in all his designs and she actually had the idea that made his first motor work. She uh, suggested using merc mercury as a conductor. Um, so she was very involved in everything that he did. Interestingly enough, she actually cut up her silk wedding dress to use as an insulator in his electromagnets. Bertha Benz was the biggest surprise. Now she wasn't involved with electric vehicles, uh, but she is heavily involved in the reason that we have an automotive industry, believe it or not. Um, Maybe even more reason than her husband, Carl. Um, she, before they were married, uh, her and Carl were in love. She came from a well-to-do family. Uh, his company, the bank came in and seized, he had a partnership, a uh, construction company. His partner left him. The bank came in and seized all his assets, took all his equipment. She talked her dad into using her dowry to pull him out of bankruptcy, and she did it more than once. Um, she was credited with the first long-distance drive in an automobile for anything at any time. Before this time, it was in 1888, before this time, none of these vehicles had gone more than a few hundred feet. Um, she was one of Carl's best mechanics. She was credited with the invention of the brake shoe, and she had the business sense of the company. Carl was a brilliant engineer. Again, he had no idea how to run a company. Um, the best story about Berta is uh, he patented his car in 1885, the first version of it. it would fit one person. Uh, you can see Berta sitting in one, uh, that's a, uh, I'm sure a mock-up, not a real photo, but um, you can see the seat only held one person. Um, he got the patent on that, he continued to work on it, but he never went more than 100 feet traveling in one of these. Um, he was up to version 3 in 1888. Uh, it had more power, uh, had a wider seat so you could fit more than one person. She, uh, the, the, there were other people trying to do the same thing that Carl, trying to make a machine that would run without the aid of a horse. On a horse, you could get about 20 miles in a day. If you did any more than that, you might hurt the horse or you'd have to let it rest for a week or two before you traveled the next day. It was hard to, to, to do a lot of miles without, you know, without a lot of uh, uh, issues. Um, she planned uh, this trip from their house to her parents' house, from uh, Mannheim to Frosheim. Um, and she took, it took her a while to do it because there weren't maps, there were, there were no road maps, but she had to plan this trip that she was going to do uh, with pharmacies along the way because the fuel that they use was a form of benzene, uh, Legroin, I think it was called. Um, and it was kind of a cleaning solvent that pharmacies had. So she had to plan her trip so that there was enough pharmacies along the way for her to travel this 100 kilometers. And, um, you know, she told Carl, she said, well, you got to do something to prove that, you know, this is a better um, uh, machine than a horse and buggy. And, you know, get up, put your big boy pants on and do something. He never did it. So finally, she worked up the nerve. Um, she got up in the middle of the night. She left a note for him. He didn't know she was leaving. She grabbed their two sons. One was 13, one was 15. They piled into one of the version threes in 1888, and they took off in the middle of the night for her parents' house, 100 kilometers away. Um, here's the route. Um, she has started to become famous for this. She's, you know, to get to get some acclaim. Um, in Germany in 2008, they finally. Uh, they followed the tracks from Mannheim to Fossheim where she went. Um, she made it. Uh, she ended up having several breakdowns along the way. At one point, her fuel line clogged and she got it unclogged with a hairpin. Um, her spark plug kept shorting out, so she took her garter off, scandalous, and wrapped the spark plug wire in it so that it wouldn't short out. Um, they, Carl had wood brakes, wood brake 
uh, and she came up with the idea along the way going downhill that she couldn't stop. So she stopped at a, a shoe smith and he, she had him fashion a set of leather shoes, break shoes, if you want to know where that term came, came from, um, so that they w it wouldn't heat up like wood did. You know, wood would start on fire if you got it too hot. Um, so she is credited with designing the brake shoe, and she did it all on this first trip. Um, and but by the time she got to Frosheim, she telegraphed back to um, Carl. He already knew about it. The, it was such a big deal. This was like putting a man on the moon, the fact that somebody could get a mechanical thing to go 100 kilometers in a day was just astounding. And the fact that it was a woman, this was like putting a person on Mars. This went, the news went around the world, and just to be a show off, the next day she drove back. And this time she took a different route. So it's a, I'd like to do this trail someday, but there's actually a race now that follows this path. So. It, Clara Ford was also very uh, surprising to me. Um, Henry Ford was kind of a bipolar guy. A lot of people didn't like him. He was tried. He, you know, at times he was a very conservative. At times he was very fascist. At times he was progressive, believe it or not. Um, but, you know, they say opposite the tract, Clara Ford hated the Model T. And she literally, she said it was noisy, smelly, and hard to start. Henry tried to hide the fact that he had to buy her an electric car, and it was the name of the company was Detroit Electric. This was capable of hauling five people. One Detroit Electric in, I think, 1927 set a record for traveling 241 miles on a single charge. Now, I don't know how they did that. Uh, part of that trip must have been downhill, um, but that's the way it was. So this is actually in the Henry Ford Museum, kind of tucked in the back. It's not something still I don't think they really want you to know about. Um, but uh, if you uh, Google Detroit electric cars, you'll see quite a history. Um, they also had regenerative braking, um, you know, way beyond their time, you would think. Claire was also heavily involved in the women's suffrage movement. Uh, she was fr good friends with Susan B. Anthony. So on the right, the top picture is Claire Ford, the bottom is Susan B. Anthony. Uh, Susan B. Anthony is quite a bit older than Claire, but. Um, Clara was directly involved with women's right to vote. She was on the board of directors for the League of Women Voters. Uh, she actually threatened to leave Henry Ford in the, uh, I think, just before 1940. Um, if he did not bring the union into Ford, at, at the time, you know, auto plants were dangerous places to work. And the unions had gotten into all the other car manufacturers except Ford. And he resisted, he did everything he could to stop it. <clears throat> she finally threatened to leave him. And it was public knowledge that she was going to leave him, and he, he finally broke. He brought the union in, and a year later, he said it was the best decision he'd ever made. Why didn't he do it sooner? So um, just w one example of uh, changes that have been made. So I have a couple of uh, reading audio and video uh, recommendations. Uh, first one's called Ingenious by Jason Fagone. This is a great book, a great audio book if you're into audio books. Even if you're not interested in cars, this is a really interesting story. Um, there's a documentary called Who Killed the Electric Car? You can look it up. I think you can get it on Netflix. It's by Sony Pictures. A um, couple of YouTube things. Uh, a Woman Who Moved the World. This is a story of Berta Benz. It's only a couple minutes long, and it kind of gives you an idea of the stuff she went through. And if you, uh, on YouTube, if you just search for Jay Leno Baker, it'll bring up this 10 minute episode that uh, actually it, it uh, gives a lot of the same information that I just gave, but it kind of verifies it. So I did, I do have to say that when I was doing this research, I thought, well, if, if women were this heavily involved in the auto industry, what about minorities? Um, so I, I uh, oh yeah, any questions or comments, feel free to contact me and we'll continue our discussion here. Um, but I wanna, I do wanna say, I looked up to see if I could find any minorities that were involved in the auto industry. And the C.R. Patterson was a slave. He escaped in 1861, um, and he, he got to Greenfield, Ohio, and he was a, he was a carriage builder. And he started a company um, that became Patterson & Sons, uh, and they were known for their high-quality carriages. 
Um, eventually, he turned the reins over to his son, Frederick. Frederick was the first African-American to play football for Ohio State. But uh, Frederick uh, turned the carriage into a car. They, they had a service department, and they were known for such high quality, uh, they started building cars, and they built several hundred of them. Um, and they were known to be the best cars. They were better than the Model T. Uh, because they had the service department, they knew what worked and what didn't, and, and they kind of mixed and matched matched pieces. They had a, they were using a, a Lincoln motor and, um, but the, the, the depression got the best of them. They only had about 80 employees and the, the depression uh, took the company down because nobody could afford an expensive car. They could only afford a Model T at the time. But that's the, the uh, earliest sign I have of a minority owned auto company. Um, I haven't found anything yet involved uh, that involves minorities with the electric vehicle in the early stages. I'm sure that information is out there. I just haven't found it yet. So if you know of anything, let me know. I'm going to go back a couple of screens. And I'm going to go stop sharing. If everybody's got this, I'm going to stop sharing. And let's go back to questions and answers. Yeah. Thank you so much, Oli. That's really fascinating. All, all new to me. I had no prior knowledge. So I feel like I, I just. I want to know more about the electric car. It's amazing that it was so, it dates back so far. Um, we got a couple questions in the chat from Dave Benferrato. Um, Dave's wondering, 15,000 EVs in New York City in 1900, any idea what percentage of vehicles that is? So how many cars were registered in New York City at the time? Do you know like what proportion? I, I don't, and that's a great question. I'm going to write it down and look it up. I, every one of these, I've done this presentation several times for several different reasons, and every time I learn as much as everybody else does, because I have to go back and look all these questions up. That's a great uh, comparison. Yeah, let's see. Um, I, I see, I, I want to mention something. I see people talking about hauling gas. Um, and you said there was no fuel infrastructure. Um, the Model T could burn three different fuels. It could burn kerosene. If you set it up, it could burn alcohol. So you could grow corn and make your own fuel for an internal combustion engine at the time. Um, that's one of the things. It was a little bit harder to make electricity at that time. So. We got a question uh, about the books and links you shared. And um, just so everyone knows, I'll share those out in a follow-up email along with the recording of the presentation, um, if that's cool with you, Oli. Yep. All right. We've got some shouts out to the women in the chat. I love that part of the history. Um, and I love that it's more common knowledge now. Um, Any more specific questions, feel free to hop off of mute. The mute button is in your lower left hand corner if you want to, to hop off and ask a question, anything that surprised you about the presentation. I have a question. Thanks, Dave. Dave, Dave here. Oli, that was fascinating. Thank you. Thank you very much. You, you sort of touched on this in your presentation that the, the technology, the EV, the base EV technology has not changed very much. But do you have any sense of the efficiency and whether there have been efficiency gains with these fancy dancy Teslas and so on? Oh, yeah. They, they're much more efficient now than they were. Uh, that's a good question, uh, by the way. Um, they, Especially, I mean, when these were done, <clears throat> these were all done with resistive uh, components or vacuum tube, some of them starting, uh, th you know, there were no solid state transistors or anything like that at the time. So there's been, a, you know, an incredible amount of technology that's, it was software and technology, uh, artificial intelligence, everything now that go into um, how, these, how these devices, how the, the cars, the electric cars, cars work today. Um, one of Tesla's biggest patents is a valve, believe it or not, that quickly can reroute coolant from a, 
a charging battery to an electric motor back and forth, whether you're, you know, you're stepping on the gas or stepping on the brake to recharge the battery. Um, it, you know, there's so much more technology now than there was just 20 years ago. So. Scott, you're and muted. Then I have a follow up. If you wouldn't mind, this is, this is on topic, but it's off topic in terms of history. If you wouldn't mind chatting about what sorts of decisions Isthmus Engineering made and considered regarding on-site charging for employees? Um, well, it varied. <laughs> uh, because we're a cooperative, we have an interesting decision-making process. And uh, we can decide to build a $4 million building in about 20 minutes. And we may argue about the color of the mailbox for two months. So. Yep. Um, yep. Yeah, uh, so when we started talking about charging stations, one of the thoughts was, well, we have to put it in a spot where we can add more if there's, you know, if we need more. And then the question came up, well, how many people are actually going to buy an electric vehicle? And uh, at the time, we only had two people, you know, that had electric vehicles. And how long does it take to charge? And are we going to charge people for using it? And it, it turns out to charge a, a vehicle, it's not much different than the price of a cup of coffee. So we actually let our employees charge their cars uh, at no cost, um, uh, just to uh, you know stay on the sustainable side. Um, and it's you know there's usually a, a spot open next to it. it. It's not something that gets overused yet. And uh, I know there's quite a few of us uh, that are thinking about getting an EV. I drive a hybrid, but it's not a plug-in hybrid yet. Um, as soon as the wheels wear off of it, I, I'll buy my first plug-in car. So, um, yeah, I, I guess that's some of the stuff off the top of my head and some of those decisions that we made as, as we uh, uh, put that project uh, into uh, the real world, so. Thank you. Speaking of, um, I have a poll. I almost forgot about it, but I would love to know uh, who joined out of the 29 people that joined us today, who drives an electric vehicle. So I'm gonna start this poll. And so you should see a question on your screen. Do you drive an electric vehicle? Yes, no, thinking about it. And if anyone who does drive an electric vehicle wants to share, <laughs> I see in the chat some people don't own a vehicle. That's where I land in this, in this group. <laughs> so feel free to not answer if you're one of those. All right, it's gone for a minute. Has everyone answered? Mm -hmm. Give me a thumbs up if you saw it and you answered, folks on video. Okay, all right, I'll end it. Oh. Okay, we have zero people voted, so must be something wrong with the poll, <laughs> but. <laughs> I'll share the results anyway. That's what it would have looked like. No, you got it. It, it, was, oh. it was there for us. Oh, it was? So maybe, oh. Yeah, yeah, there you go. You got it. Can you see the results? Yep. All right, I can't 14, for some reason. 14% but... 14 yes, 43% hmm. no, 48% thinking about it. OK, that's great to know. I think that's probably pretty skewed because the folks here are interested in EVs, but um, very good to know. All right, we've got a question in the chat. Um, probably our last question or maybe our second to last. Um, what is your informal outlook on the rate of EV uptake in the general population? Oli. Um, obviously, this is just an opinion. Um, I think it's going to continue to increase slowly. I don't, even if you don't like it, I think it's here to stay now. Uh, you see it creeping into everything from, we were talking before the presentation started about bicycles. Um, they, ha they now have electric combines that they're showing at the egg shows. And, you know, I know a lot of the farmers 
uh, out in the Great Plains now, they farm the wind. Um, Gary Fawn, uh, who's uh, part of the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association, is on, online with us here, I see today. Um, and he can attest to this, that they, the farmers, you know, they put up the big windmills now, they call it farming the wind. And that's one of their uh, income streams to support their farms now is farming the wind. And just think if a farmer could put solar panels on his barn and all year long he could, he could sell that electricity back to the grid. Um, but then during planting season or harvest season, which are times when we're not air conditioning, that he could buy back at a reduced rate that electricity that he gave out to everybody um, so that he could, you know, put his crops in or take his crops out. Um, th there's a lot of uh, potential, I guess, and it's going to take a lot of ingenuity, but I mean, every category, whether it's egg, food production, um, transportation, um, you're going to see electric vehicles all over the place. We're, we're talking about replacing our fork trucks with electric fork trucks, which a lot of places already have. So it's, it, it's coming. There isn't anything anybody can do to stop it. Um, I don't know if the breaking point will be very quick or if it'll just be gradual. Um, well, that remains to be seen, I guess. So I know I'm, my next vehicle will be a, a plug-in hybrid of some sort. Dave, Dave, Dave Imperato with a yeah, quick, Dave. quick add on there. Oli, um, true, true disclosure, I work for Madison Gas and Electric. <laughs> so, <laughs> and just as a follow up to what you mentioned, uh, there will be three all electric buses rolling around Madison starting this summer. And we're going to try to wrap them with some EV messaging. And so just little, little, you know, little messaging here and there amongst all of us on this call uh, can help bend that curve upwards a bit. Thanks, Dave. And thank you so much, Oli, for sharing your knowledge with everyone. Um, again, I'll send out a follow-up email with some useful links. Um, I'm seeing some links dropped in the chat as well, so I'll, I'll include, there's a Berta Benz video that people might be interested in, so I'll share as much as I can. And, um, just Can a I quick one plug. thing. Oh, yeah. I was going to say for another perspective, um, I've spent a fair amount of time at the Spark Building, uh, the starting block. Uh, Zerology is a company that's using Teslas for transportation, but also a much more global view of how to use electric cars plus co sharing. So uh, you might want to hop onto their site for uh, even additional information about electric cars and. Uh, their vision for the future. Yeah, and reach out to me. Uh, we actually had Xerology, Sheree uh, from Xerology speak at one of our Sustainable Breakfast Series events, and we do have a recording of that um, if anyone is interested. Um, I can also put that in the follow-up email. Thanks for bringing that up, Keith. Um, and then one, one plug before we go here, our next program at Sustain Dane is next week, the 25th, It'll be a group volunteer day with Second Food or Second Harvest Food Bank of South Central Wisconsin, and um, that will be Thursday, June twenty fifth, um, at twelve thirty. So look out for that. I'll put the link in the follow up email as well. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank and you. We'll see you next time. Okay. Thank you, Oli. You're very welcome. Bye. -bye. You guys enjoy the rest of the day. You too.